Hello, this is Professor Roger L. Martinez Davila. Today we'll be discussing Jews, Catholics, and converts in Plasencia, Spain during the 15th century. And I've titled this lecture, Reassessing the Resilience of Covivencia in 15th Century Spain, Plasencia, because it is about figuring out what was going on during the 15th century. We know there was a great deal of stress inside the Castilian system in terms of Jewish, Catholic, and Muslim relations. But what exactly was occurring across the kingdom? And more importantly, what was happening in this locality? And how can we assess what was most important to this community? So what you're seeing right now are just some images flashing at the Plaza Mayor in uh, Plasencia, one of my favorite places in the world. And even at 9 or 10 o'clock at night, it's quite busy. So here is our overview. First, we'll go ahead and define covivencia or coexistence one more time because I want to make sure that we fully understand this concept because it is complicated. It's not just a simple, um, easygoing kind of coexistence amongst peoples. It's more complicated than that. We'll talk a little bit about the historiography or the history of the history written about Jewish and conversal communities during the 1390s and 1450s, because what we see is a very uh, different range of outcomes for each of these communities across Castile. And it just complicates the story. And that's, that's a good thing from a historical perspective. Uh, complicated stories are often better in the sense that they provide more granular detail and explication. Also, then we're going to talk about uh, Covavincia transformed under two specific families in Placencia, specifically the Carvajales and the Santa Marias. Uh, we'll discuss um, some conclusions, and then I might offer some comments about the limits of tolerance in this period. So sources. As you might remember, what we are looking at is an image of the Cathedral of Placencia's Cathedral Archive, and those are the lagajos arranged up on the wall. If you see the, the book case on the left-hand side, those are standard books, some of those from the 1800s. But on the right-hand side, just on the other side of the portico, that is where the historical uh, lagajos or bundles begin. So if you see the upper left-hand corner of that bookcase, you'll see that it's empty. That it's, and that's where I've pulled out Lagajo One, which is sitting on the table in the foreground. So and that's where they are. So the, the the things that I usually mostly have used for this lecture, as well as for my own investigations, are these capitulary acts or the governing chapter acts for the Cathedral Placencia. But I also look at ones in Burgos as well as um, in other communities. Wills and last testaments, dowry letters, genealogies from a variety of different sources, whether those are the Archivo Histórico Nacional, the Seccion Nobleza, or the Real Academia de la de Historia, or the Biblioteca Nacional. Also, we can look at brief ecclesiastical histories, many, many of them penned in the 16th and 17th centuries. And also we can look at royal orders and decrees also coming from municipal and cathedral archives. And you can see here at the bottom of the screen, this is the opening of the original uh, Actus Capitulars uh, book one. And you see the giant looks like two eyes looking at you on their side, but that is a big E. So in el nombre de Dios, so in the name of God. And that is the cover page or the cover parchment on the left hand side. So let's continue. So as we've discussed in the past, one of the issues that is happening inside of a Spanish historiography and understanding Spain is this uh, attention amongst different historians and perspectives about what is the truth of Spain. Is there this, and in some ways, and this is very much so revealing how I approach this, and I think it's important for you to understand my approach uh, so that you can evaluate my own suppositions and decisions because mine is an interpretation. Everybody comes to their histories through different interpretations and different lenses. I think there are many truths. So in this case, um, one of the things we might discuss is the myth of one eternal Spain. So for the Spanish in this grander context of the 15th century and 16th century, especially after unification uh, under Queen Isabel and King Ferdinand, was this myth that was kind of almost a mantra that Spain had always been one people, Catholic and Castilian. And 
Um, this is not necessarily the case. We know that this has been a, a, a place of many different peoples and different faith groups and many different ethnic and linguistic groups. So Castilian is one of several. Um, and that we know that this kind of perspective is very much so kind of uh, brought to the forefront through uh, historian Claudio Sanchez Albornoz, who is the primary kind of advocate of this mentality that to some extent dismissed Islamic and Jewish past, that, that Spain should, could best be understood as a Catholic and a Castilian country. Now, in the context of defining Covivencia, two scholars that I consider that are, that are very important in this dialogue are Ramon Menendez uh, Pidal and Américo Castro, both who, who began to work with this notion of Covivencia or coexistence. Um, and we know that, that Ramon was a philologist and a historian and historical work on um, Orígenes del Español. Um, he was looking at the emergence of early Romance languages in the peninsula. And so he was starting to look at this idea of coexistent forms or coexistent norms inside of language. Now, I'm not a literature professor or a literature scholar, but I do, do appreciate his work in the sense of for us to fully uh, appreciate Castilian, Spanish, and other variants of the Spanish language, we know that there are different types of norms that that coexist within it, that allow for, for understanding, and that those norms actually might extend outside of maybe a native kind of Castilian or a native Iberian um, background. And in that sense, that's where we really can turn to Americo Castro, who you've read a little bit about already in this course, uh, specifically who is a historian as well, a native of Granada, Spain, and himself was a descendant of Jewish converts to Christianity or conversos. So defining coevencia, in this sense, I, I think about coevencia's notion of challenging the myth of one eternal Spain. And his point, I think, one of the, that kind of really kind of captures this idea is that Castro discovered that Miguel Cervantes um, could not be understood purely in European terms because of the impact of Islamic and Jewish literary thought on Spanish Golden Age literature. And he proposes transforming this idea of coevencia that was first proposed by his mentor in an attempt to go beyond the discussion of sibling romance languages, that really Covivencia should really be understood as an attempt to understand intercultural life in medieval Spain and Al-Andalus, or the, uh, the Islamic name for Spain. And as we know from Thomas Glick that you've kind of seen him, seen in the past is that, that Covivencia can be defined loosely as coexistence but carries connotations of mutual interpenetration, creative influence, even as it embraces the phenomena of mutual friction, rivalry, and suspicion. And I think that is the really the substance of this term. We don't want to, to simplify this notion so much so that we think that, that these were pleasant and wonderful times at all times, nor do we want to describe them entirely as horrible times. Rather, it's rather complicated. And that we, what we find is a variety of different norms, a lot of different interchanging of ideas from some people to other people, in some ways, you know, very much so suspicious of one another. So you could find the whole range of experiences inside of the Iberian Peninsula. And I think that's that's the most important thing is that we can't necessarily uh, rely on one simple explanation for the phenomena inside of Spain, but rather it was a range of experiences. Now, in the same way that we have inside of Spanish historiography, a, a type of kind of tension among different uh, approaches to the history of the Iberian Peninsula, in the other way, we also can consider Sephardic history or Sephardic Judaic history as also having its own kind of norms about what is occurring in Spain. And to some extent, we have to confront some universalistic tendencies inside of, of this historiography. Now, um, what I'm going to say is that uh, we are in, the in, our, in debt to individuals and scholars like Jose Amador de los Rios and others who have championed the study of the Spanish Jewish people and their experiences. 
one of the challenges that we find is because in the same way that we find this kind of myth of one eternal Spain that is so forceful in arguing for a Catholic Spain, in the other sense, we almost have a, a, a reciprocal response. And this can come from Sephardic historiography where it's very much a, a notion of, of preservation and survival. And you know, God willing, you know, whatever it takes to 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 survive the difficult times that there were that that ex existed throughout the Middle Ages. So Jose Amador de los Rios, in, in one of his texts, describes um, you know the experience of the uh, the programs in the 1390s in this way. He says, in truth, the horrid butchering that occurred in the Spanish Juderias during the year 1391 was a vast conspiracy that has as as its objective their total annihilation. However, it was a conspiracy made in the light of day and proposed with vehement desire. It's very powerful language, um, and it's very evocative of, I think, of a, an important perspective, which is clearly the Jewish communities in Spain and Portugal were under incredible stress, and there was uh, difficulties in, in all ways, whether these are forced conversions, uh, of mass killings, and deportations. However, if we start to consider the broader range of experiences during the 1400s in Spain, we find that it is m the rich. The history is much richer than just this one story. So we just certainly want to capture this story and appreciate it for what it is. But also, we should do our best to figure out what are the other types of stories that exist out there. Were there a variety of experiences, or was this the nominal or the, the normative, I should say, experience for all Jewish communities? And I think what you'll see uh, in this presentation, as well as in the article I provided to you uh, for this week, which was titled Jews, Catholics, and Converts, Reassessing the Resilience of Covivencia in 15th Century Spain, or Placencia, Spain, that um, there was a, a wide range of activities or uh, responses to this, this difficult time period. So one of the things we can appreciate, and this is because I'm trying to recontextualize what is happening during this period and, and reapproach the history from some fresh eyes. And one of those areas is this issue of the Santa Maria family. And then during the 20th century, we do find there quite a few um, attacks on the Santa Maria family from historians. And this is a complicated one as well. For instance, uh, Jose Amador de los Rios proposed that Bishop Pablo de Santa Maria was a leading force in the creation of the anti-Jewish ordinances of Valladolid in 1412. Um, and that in this sense, uh, the Santa Maria family, which were converts from Judaism to Catholicism, previously the Levy family had been, you know, in many ways, the, the, on the front lines of um, of attacking their former co-religionists. Again, I think the story is a little bit more complicated, and what we can do is look at a couple different pieces of evidence. So first, Castilians implemented only two of the law's provisions in the ordinances of Valladolid in 1412, namely the removal of Jews to separate quarters and their exclusion from tax farming and from the service of state and the court. So these are the two primary ones that seem to have been implemented so clearly there was a type of, of restrictions placed on, on Jewish communities, and certainly um, this is unpleasant. This is really beyond unpleasant. It is, uh, it is a type of racial and ethnic and religious um, banishment and hatred. Um, also, we can appreciate that further the ordinances were intended to increase the social and economic distance of Jews and Jewish converts to Christianity, or those conversos or new Christians. So what we can appreciate here is, is that um, there seems to have been a great deal of nervousness inside of Castilian society in the early 1400s that, that new arrivals in Christianity from Judaism were susceptible to backsliding, that they would uh, maybe revert to their Judaism or those cultural connections might not fully break off and that um, it would be difficult for them to be fully assimilated into a Castilian and Catholic world. Um, it's, it's hard to say what was really going on, and I'm, I'm not going to make a decision here. Um, I'm just going to report the record, which is they're doing this to separate communities from one another. Now, 
Uh, just a quick note to my audience, I want to say it is critical that we acknowledge the horrid outcomes of the, for the Sephardic Jewish community, that in no way can we underestimate how horribly uh, Jewish communities were treated. And in the same way, I think we can argue that Muslim communities and Morisco communities in the 1500s were treated quite horribly as well. So I'm not diminishing that history. I'm just trying to contextualize it in a more comprehensive manner so that you can make your own decisions about what you think. And that's that's what's most important to me is what you think about it and not what I think about it, how you put pair your own kind of interpretations of this history. I would also say as historians, we must do more, that we must investigate these difficult topics so we can pay homage to the granularity and complexity of life in late medieval Spain. And that is essentially, I think, the historian's quest is once we kind of dive into these documents, you know, how do we bring voices alive from them? How do we share those experiences and those lifetimes with people that are living today so that that those stories aren't lost? And that requires a certain level of, of complexification. So let's think about Covivencia and the Plata de Jurerias during the 15th century and what was occurring. So we, what we can see here is, a, is an outline of the Iberian Peninsula and the primary kingdoms that, it, that exist at that time. So the Kingdom of Aragon and then the Nasrid Kingdom of Granada to the south, uh, the Kingdom of Portugal to the left, and then also in the central part, the Kingdom of Castile and Leon. So we're going to take a look at a couple of these cities and figure out what exactly was happening during the 1400s, specifically as these kind of anti-Jewish riots occurred. So the first two places I'd like to consider are Valencia and Salamanca. And I've circled them red and, and signaled um, the difficulty of these lives with fire because it was pretty difficult. Um, we know in the 1390s that this was a difficult period uh, in terms of Christian attacks. Um, for instance, in July of 1391, a massive wave of persecution and attacks visited the Jews of Valencia. At this time, um, the author Don Vila states, in order to inspire terror in the Hebrew people, Christians erected gallows in the plazas and streets near the Juraria. Following these acts of intimidation, the Christian attacks began and Jews sought refuge in blockaded homes and in synagogues that were ultimately overwhelmed by the onslaught. As if possessed by satanic fury, the Christians looted what they could and destroyed what they could not carry off. Furthermore, the Christians' aggression turned into a murderous assault, and within a short period, hundreds of bodies of Jewish men, women, and children littered Valencia streets. Those, student, those Jews that survived the riots sought refuge in the close-by community of Mar Verde. By 1394, Valencia's Jewish quarter was deserted, and its synagogues converted to churches. So we know that certainly there are some horrid moments in Spanish history in this sense about what is happening to Jewish communities. Similarly, we, we can look at Salamanca, where the tragedy arrived much later. Although Salamanca Jews survived the anti-Jewish attacks of the 1390s, they were unable to escape Friar Vincent Ferrer's aggressive proselytizing in the Kingdom of Castile and Leon in, the 14, in 1411. Ferrer's initiative brought about the dismantlement of the Juderia, the conversion of most of its Jews, and the expulsion of those who would not convert. The cities such as Salamanca and Valencia represent the extreme negative in outcomes for Jewish communities. Let's next take a look at Sevilla. So, in many ways, the Salamanca Jewish experience mimic what transpired in Sevilla after 1391. Sevilla, the first town rocked by anti-Jewish violence, experienced extensive bloodshed and destruction. By 1412, most Jews had converted to Christianity, and the remaining numbers were initially confined to a neighborhood adjacent to the city's Gate of Cordoba. Additionally, city leaders moved conversos to other sections of the city to prevent them from routinely interacting with Jews. And then subsequently, in 1437, due to overcrowding, King Juan II granted some Jewish families permission to reside in other zones of the city. So what we can see is in, um, in Sevilla, there's a tremendous amount of stress here, but also there's some accommodation at the end, which is we, we can't keep Jews in, in one zone only. There's just too many people. 
and so they will they will expand out of areas. So it starts to tell the story of of complication. How about other cities like Murcia or Lerida? So let me just take a quick look at my notes here. So for example, the city of Murcia. The Murcian Jews found themselves at first protected by the community's leaders. However, they later were increasingly isolated from their Christian neighbors and under distress, disc, duress to convert. While Murcia did not did have a distinct Jewish quarter, uh, and by 1266, Juan Torres Fontes argues that the boundaries of the community were difficult to ascertain because gates and walls did not enclose all of its sections. Furthermore, Jews in Mercy reportedly did not suffer any of the injuries during the calamitous riots of the 1390s due to the intervention of Bishop Pedrosa, who prevented an attack on the Juderia. Rather, the city was, quote-unquote, an oasis of peace, and the city council actively punished reclamations pursued, I'm sorry, pursued reclamations for Jews injured in the neighboring communities of Arroyeja. Um, and then also in 1490, uh, 1392, we know that, that the city council did express its occur concerns about Jews' influence on conversos. And here we find a very similar outcome where they were ordering that no conversa should live in or near the Alhama, the Jewish uh, part of town, and that no conversa could enter it at nightfall. Uh, similarly, we find in Lerida, there were municipal laws enacted there uh, to kind of uh, to minimize the interaction of individuals as well. Lastly, let's consider a couple other Castilian communities. And I've circled these in green because in many ways, we can see that the outcomes for Jewish communities were, were significantly different than they had been in Valencia and Salamanca, thus kind of complexifying what was occurring. So, for instance, in the towns of Astorga, Avila, Sea, Cordoba, Leona, Toledo, in each of these towns, Jewish Alhama survived the 1390s um, and even perhaps thrived despite inconsistently imposed constraints. Uh, Francisco Cantera argues in the late 14th century, Astorgan Jews resided in two Jurerias. However, these areas were not encapsulated with walls. While the Jewish quarter that housed the city's only synagogue, which was near the Gate of the Sun, appears to have been solely a Jewish residential zone, as did other Jewish neighborhoods, on the whole, Jewish families resided in many different places in the town. In fact, Jews, open quote, lived in different central points in the city, mixed in with other residents, which demonstrates the great tolerance afforded to them, close quote. However, after 1412, the historian historian M. Rodriguez notes that Jews were subjugated to significant persecution, yet there is no historical record to support this claim. What is evident is that the Jewish community continued to exist in Astorga, but in smaller numbers. And likewise, Astorga's neighboring cities of Leonisea housed their own discrete quarters in the early 15th century. But we also see, again, Jews residing among Christians. So it's a very complicated history where sometimes uh, Jews are, are living in their own zones, fortunately over their own sense, sometimes they're mixing. In Avila, uh, according to Pilar Leon Telo, during the latter part of the 14th century, Jews congregated residentially with Christians in the city's principal commercial zones. But after 1412, Jews began to re be relocated to the city's Juraria. Evidence of this residential change in Avila became apparent in 1416, when Bishop Juan de Guzman ordered his canons to no longer lease cathedral-owned homes to Jews and Muslims, and instead to move these minorities to their respective quarters. Interestingly, this cathedral policy in Avila was not mirrored in the close-by city of Placencia. As will be explored shortly, the cathedral of Placentia rapidly expanded housing opportunities for Jews and Muslims, which, which was in direct contradiction to the restrictive ordinances of Valladolid. While the cathedral of Avila did not rigorously implement Bishop Guzman's instructions, a distinct and delimited Jewish alhama was in place in the city by 1425. Therefore, what we can see is Leon Tello's scholarship reveals that as the early 15th century unfolded in Avila, Life for its Jewish community became increasingly restrictive as compared to the living arrangements in the previous century. So 
I'm going to leave it there because there's lots that you can read more about in the article that would tell you uh, about the specific experiences of these different communities. And um, you can look into them. But what we can see, I think, ultimately is that there's a range of possibilities from very, very bad outcomes to ones that were more res restrictive but not uh, total annihilation. And that's, I think, an important issue at hand. What we're seeing during this time period, ultimately in this 15th century, is this kind of societal breakdown in positive forms of covivencia. So I often think about covivencia or coexistence as both positive and negative. And what I'm trying to emphasize here is that there's less and less of the positive going around. Now, I think some of this has to do with, one, the dramatic impact of the 1390s and the creation of new Christians or conversos or these Jewish converts to Christianity. And I think this might have kind of really impacted the, the Castilian oligarchy in, in a, a significant, or I should say nobility uh, in, a, in a significant way because there was intensive uh, intermarriage of old Christian families, those families that were of, of uh, ancient lineages of Christian Christianity, and new Christian elite families, conversos. Also, we see that there's this evaporation of many Jewish communities across uh, across Spain, but there's some persistence clearly in Placencia, as we'll see. And then also there's this popular Christian notion about religious and biological purity of its religious and noble leaders, in the sense that we start to create new laws during this period, restricting blood purity laws, limpieza de sangre laws, that restricted access of conversos into um, key roles as religious leaders in the church or as royal bureaucrats. The great irony is, though, is that conversos dominated the royal and church bureaucracy. So there's this uh, amazing contradiction here, which is simultaneously as a society is becoming more recalcitrant in its distaste for uh, Jewish individuals and families and faith, uh, Jewish families that are converting are experiencing more power inside of, 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 of Castilian society. One thing that I, I think we do need to appreciate is the seismic shift in Castilian society in terms of the underestimated cultural impact of a 14th century uh, Castilian war between um, two brothers, Enrique and Pedro. Um, in that Castilian civil war, the the nobility was depleted, bankrupted, and left um, Castile in a horrible state of affairs uh, by the 1370s or so. And what happened is, what we find is there was a new nobility that was generated uh, during the late 1300s and opening of the 1500s. And it was a blending of new peoples. And what we can do is look at uh, one scholar's work on mayorazgos or entailed lands. These are manorial lands that would be uh, collected by a family and then passed from one generation to the next. So we can always think of this as this kind of patrilineal descent. But Bartolomé de la Clavero's work, he looked at elite noble families in Spain, specifically La Grandeza, the grand nobility. And what we can find through his research is that four of the eight new nobility, elite noble families probably had Jewish origins. And this, in some ways, kind of brings up the issue of the rejuvenation and tension in Jewish Catholic convivencia, because the converses are occupying this unusual space where they have cultural connections back to uh, another people and another faith, but they're also entering into the world, and they are kind of these hybrids. And Castilian society really doesn't know how to deal well with, with this hybridity. So for a little evidence, we can consider these feudal entailed lands and the new nobility. These are, um, these are eight, of the, the first, eight of the first new noble families that were generated during the late 1300s and early 1400s. And these were mayorazgos that were formed by noble families that were authorized by the king. And specifically, the king allowed in his will for the creation of these entailed lands so that they could be consolidated and pass from one family to the next. And what I've done here is I've put some blue stars uh, alongside of these names of Pedro González Mendoza, Rodrigo Ponce de Leon, 
Diego Lopez de Estuniga or Zuniga, and Rodrigo Alfonso de Pimentel. And we know that these four families actually had Jewish uh, descendants in them or ancestors in them, and they also had Jewish relations in them. And it, so it tells you as this new kind of elite is gaining steam inside of uh, Castilian society, it is one that's very hybridized and powerful. And it creates uh, an incredible tension inside the, the upper echelons of society. And obviously, which you might expect, the commoners, as they look up above them, um, there's obviously some, some religious jealousies, some economic jealousies, and, and those types of issues might be playing out as well. So let's consider the issue of covivencia as it adapts in placencia. And now I've circulated a circle of placencia here on the map. You can see one of the things I've really studied closely is this critical confederation. And I think of this, I describe it as a confederation because it's more than kind of family, uh, you know, intermarriage at the edges. It's intermarriage, it's economic integration, it is patronage. It is all aspects of, of life being integrated. So it is a confederation of the old Christian Carver Hall family and the Converso Santa Maria Alevi family. And what we can do is we can see this through cathedral practices that supported Covivencia. So in Placencia, when these two families control the cathedral, they seem to operate under a notion of more positive kind of coexistence and they seem to support a type of residential intermixing of religious groups. And to some extent, I, I think this might be back to the point of how the Carvajales, who are uh, have come from an old Christian background, they may have some Jewish uh, lineages within them or connected to them, but clearly the Santa Maria's had been Jewish, that the kind of hybrid uh, uh, confederation they built allowed for kind of an uncommon respect and uh, appreciation for Covivencia. So as you are familiar with already, here's our uh, 16th century depiction of the city of Placencia. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of places for you because we're going to start to look at it really closely today. So first, in this first image, this is contemporary Placencia. And you can see where the Jewish quarter is pointed to with the, with the arrow, where the cathedral was located, where the Plaza Mayor was located, and where the Muslim quarter was located. So you can see how that city stretches out. In addition, in our next image, you can see a little bit of the zoom of the area that I'm most interested in, which is uh, the Judaria in the area also around the cathedral. So the convent is St. Vincent Ferrer, who I was just discussing earlier, who is this aggressive proselytizer. Um, is, uh, there's a convent in his name there, as well as the former location, the synagogue built uh, was is right there. The Church of St. Nicholas, who we've, which we've started to investigate a little bit of. The old cathedral, which existed in the, in the pre-1500s, and the new cathedral post-1500s. And you can see the, the two different structures. They're, it's built together. It's you know integrated together. But there are definitely two different um, structures here that were, were uh, hammered together, so to speak. Now, to appreciate coexistence, of you know Catholics, Jews, and converts in this area, I, I I look through the lens of three primary families. So the first one is the Carver Hall family, and these are lower lower noble knights. Um, they were relatively modest in, in their income, and they had been in the service of the king probably since the 1200s, originally from Lyon. Um, and you can see where um, Diego uh, Gonzalez de San, uh, Diego Gonzalez de Carvajal lived on the Plaza Mayor, so he's on, next to the big open space. And then we can follow some of the other family living more towards the ecclesiastical district. Now we also then have the Santa Maria family or the Levies. And here, this is an ecclesiastical family, a, a bureaucratic royal bureaucratic family. They also lived in the vicinity of the Carvajales. And lastly, the Estuniga family, who were these elite title nobles who, who appear to have, have come from a, a Jewish lineage themselves, uh, at least one arm of the family. I would say that that's a controversial uh, position, but in my distinct uh, investigation of dowry letters and also uh, last wills and testaments and the uh, National Historic Archive 
uh, the nobility section in Toledo, I have seen with my own eyes and held with my own hands uh, individual testaments that name uh, one of the original family members uh, was the last name was Leosa, but in an early version of the of the family name was Levy. So we do know that there was some kind of trans uh, change of name through the process of creating new last wills and testaments. Um, it's a complicated history, and I think this is partially about creating a new family that is elite and, and forgetting a past and, and moving forward versus the Santa Marias who uh, were so well known um, and so beholden to the crown and the church, they they never really, they neither could either escape their Jewish past, much less did they, they seem to intent on escaping it. They often embraced it. Uh, for example, Alfonso de Cartagena wrote a text called In Defense of Christian Unity, which argues the the notion of, and this is during the 1400s, that you know once someone converts to Catholicism, then they're a Catholic. And so we're all brothers in, in arms in that sense. So the Santa Maria's in many ways seem to be arguing for the full integration of converts. Now, we can look at the Santa Maria's um, genealogy, and this is a symbol by looking through a couple of different sources, not only sources uh, from the Cathedral Archives in Placencia, but also works uh, by Cantera Burgos and uh, other scholars, uh, uh, also another scholar by the last name of Serrano. And you can see the, the kind of this lineage. So you can see the original Pablo, Bishop Pablo Santa Maria, who is going to be this first generation convert who used to be Solomon Halevi. And then um, his brother, Alvaro Garcia de Santa Maria, who is a, a royal bureaucrat. But then we can start to follow the families. And I'm most interested in this family that came to Placencia. So you'll see in the third row, you'll see Gonzalo Garcia de Santa Maria, who is the Bishop of Placencia during the early 1400s. It's particularly important to see him because um, when he comes to Placencia, he brings with him a, a broader extended family that starts to integrate within society and, and lo in the local area. So then we'll also see Afonso Rodriguez de Maluenda to the right-hand side, who, uh, who is uh, in the area of Coria. And you can see this other thing is very fascinating about this like transformation of names. So, for instance, you'll see in the first generation of the green blocks, Santa Maria is the last name that's used, Gutierrez de la Calleja. And Calleja literally means the alleyway, and I'm going to show you the alleyway where they picked out that name. And then Rodriguez de Maluenda. But then we see the second generation using a new name. So the Santa Maria name disappears, and then it's now Gutierrez de la Calleja. And then a generation later, it's Fernandez de Cabreros. And finally, another generation after this one, which is not depicted here, it'll become just Cabreros. So there's this process of, of cleansing of names so that you can't trace the family. That seems to be the issue here. Um, now, one of the ways that we can assemble how these people are related is, for instance, in the Cathedral of Placencia and the Actus Capitulares, they describe the Gutierrez de Calleja and Santa Maria families as blood relations specifically. So this is an important determination. And the reason why that would show up in the Actus Capitulares is often, again, we know inside these documents that we're transcribing, they're describing uh, specifically, you know, financial transactions where people are benefiting from the lease of properties. And they're very clear in these, in these notations to say, oh, you know, my uncle, my daughter, my son, um, when they're closely associated with the church, they, they will name these folks in this way. And in this context, we know that the, the Gutierrez de la Calleja family uh, is described as a blood relation of the Santa Maria family. Now, on the other side, we can see the Carpal Hall family. And I have a much broader perspective here. And this is starting to get at the point of appreciating um, how there was a confederation created by two families in Placencia and this kind of uh, transformative moment. So in the upper left-hand corner, we'll see Diego Gonzalez de Carvajal y Vargas, who is a knight. And you'll see that black box in, his, in the left-hand corner of his name. And then you'll also see he's a regidor or a city councilman. So this is the origin of this Carvajal family in Spain in the late 
and Placentia, Spain in the late uh, 1300s, early 1400s. Now, something very unusual happens here, which is we often describe uh, this kind of trajectory of medieval norms or medieval um, a medieval kind of ways of life as, you know, if your father was a tailor, you will be a tailor. If, you know, if your if your father was a nobleman, you will probably continue to be a, a lineage of nobles. The, one of the counterpoints to that is that often families got locked into for generation upon generation into certain roles. So churchmen, knights, commoners, uh, tailors, blacksmiths, and these become, you know, long-standing family traditions. Well, what's so unusual about the Carver Halls and why I describe them as transformed, and this is a following the lineage from the late 1390s all the way up to about 1512, 15, 1515, somewhere around there, across that time period, we see a transformation of these families. So at first, what we can see is Diego González Carvajal, and we don't see any of his other families, but they're a family of knights. However, basically, within two generations, then you know, so we see Mencia González de Carvajal, his his daughter, has a, a a a range of children here. But at that third generation, there we see Dr. García López de Carvajal, so the grandson of the knight will become a regidor, which is to be expected, but he also becomes a royal judge, a royal bureaucrat. This is a breakthrough moment for the Carvajalas because they're entering into a whole new range of experience. Similarly, we find another son who becomes an archdeacon. There had never been a churchman in the family before, so this is a new change. And then as expected, there is one family member that continues along uh, in the uh, tradition of knighthood. Also, then we can follow on the other side of the family. We see Sarah de Carvajal, the other, uh, the other daughter. There are other children in this family, but these are ones I wanted to highlight. Again, in this third generation, we find something quite remarkable. We see a Juan de Carvajal, who will not only be a churchman, but he will be named a cardinal. This is just unheard of during the Middle Ages, that you would have some family that is a low-level functionary knight family, and within two generations later, they're generating a cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church. This is just does not happen. So something is happening transformative for the Carvajalas because all of a sudden, they are generating knights, royal judges, and churchmen. And then we see that kind of uh, progressing along in fourth and fifth generations, all the way to the point where we can see uh, in the one, two, three, four, fifth generation, we can see the ambassador and then the Senor de Torrejon, Garcia Lopez de Carvajal y Sande. We see Bernardino Lopez de Carvajal, who will be another cardinal who challenged, I believe, Pope Julius II for the papacy. Um, we'll see Francisco de Vargas, a royal treasurer. So, and then most importantly, I would say, is Dr. Lorenzo Galindo de Carvajal, who is the Correo Mayor of the Consejo de Indias as, as you know that that government the gubernatorial administration for the Americas in the fi- early 1500s so there is this radical change inside this family and one of the issues i wanted to understand about what's going on in Placencia and this broader issue of convivencia is like how did this occur what changed for this Carvajal family during this time period that would have facilitated or could it have helped to create a new family. And what I think it might be related to is this creation of a durable confederation in the cathedral. Specifically, these old Christian Carver Hall families intermarry, but also more importantly, integrating with these converso families and binding themselves together in spite of like changing societal attitudes. So think about this. You know, it's after the 1390s. There's been the the horrible Jewish anti-Jewish riots. There's increasingly blood purity laws restricting converses from royal service and ecclesiastical service. We're starting to march till 1478. The establishment of the Inquisition in 1480 when it will actually begin to be implemented, um, and finally in 1492 the expulsion of the Jews. During the same time period, we find the Carvajal family and the Santa Marias starting to form a very, very tight relationship inside of Placencia in relationship to the cathedral. 
And so what you can look at it, we can track this through the Actus Capitulares and see what's happening. So before the 1420s in Placencia, there was no Carver Hall and there was no Santa Maria inside the cathedral. They had not been able to penetrate this fortress of, of, of ecclesiastical rule. But in 1420, for the very first time, we see a Gonzalo Gutierrez de la Calleja, a Santa Maria Converso family member, enters in as the treasurer. And more importantly, then we see the Carvajales in the far left-hand corner, the first archdeacon of Placencia and Bejar. And then 1424, Gonzalo Garcia de Santa Maria uh, becomes the bishop. So right away, what you can see is you're looking at the most important positions inside the cathedral. For the two uh, the two most important archdeaconships, uh, the Placencia and Bejar and the Trijo Medellin, as well as the Archdeacon of Coria, which will eventually become its own kind of uh, cathedral. Then we have the treasurer, the cantor, the vicar general, who is the representative of the bishop on the cathedral's uh, leadership council, and then the bishop. So in the 1420s, all of a sudden, all these positions are locked up. Everywhere where you see green is the Santa Maria family member who is holding an office. Everywhere you see the light brown is a Carvajal holding an office. And what I think is probably most informative in this image is this switch in bishops. Between 1424 and 1446, the Santa Maria has held the bishop prick. Uh, and then in 1446 to 1468, it passed on to Juan de Carvajal, who would become a cardinal himself. So you would think, you know, once the Carvajalas were named bishops of Placencia in 1446, that maybe this, you know, maybe there really wasn't a confederation here. There wasn't a close binding and connection in these two families. And instead, what do we find out? No. In the first, you know, probably uh, 20 or 30 years of Carvajal's uh, bishop, uh, uh, his role as bishop, he keeps the Santa Maria's engaged fully inside of the uh, church administration and shares the Carver Halls and the Santa Maria share roles inside the church, indicating, you know, there is a good relationship here that it's working well for these folks. And to some extent, I think it relates back to the Carver Halls being trained up by the Santa Maria family and being trained in, as good administrators of the church, as good uh uh, facilitators of action inside the cathedral and learning how to govern. And this is the same time period where we're seeing fewer knights inside the family and more royal ministers and churchmen. So it's something about this relationship between the two families that is facilitating this, this uh, growth. Now, we do see by the 1480s, things are really starting to change. And we see the Carvajales starting to come online almost uh, exclusively inside of the cathedral. Now, what do we know is happening here? Well, we're getting close to 1480 and then 1492, and we're ex experiencing the height of the anti-Jewish uh, animosity, the expulsion of the Jews, and ultimately this aggressive uh, aggressive effort to purge uh, church and religious church and religious institutions and royal bureaucracies of conversos. So. What we see clearly are names are dropping off, and we see Carvajalas are filling roles, and Santa Maria is less so. But in my own investigations, I've found the Santa Maria is appearing in different eras in the 1500s under different names. And also, I think there's a type of laundering that is going on here, where the Carvajalas are moving uh, other extended family members of the Santa Maria into the church to work alongside of them. So it's a complicated time period. And in fact, we know um, one of the Actus Capitulares, one of the books for this period from the, I think, roughly the 1460 to the 1480s, one of the most problematic eras, we're missing that book. It has been destroyed or it's been lost. And as I've kind of described earlier, these documents often will tell you who's related to who. So I often wonder what has happened to that book. Was it lost intentionally? Uh, was it unintentionally lost? Um, I know it probably would have explained a little bit more about the family relationships between these and, and how they might have continued or not continued. So why would these two families potentially work together? Well, ultimately, I think 
And for me, it's as always about following the economic resources that are available to you. So the power of the cathedral. So here we have a map of the greater uh, northern Extremadura. You'll see Placencia to the north and that big black kind of oval. And then you can follow uh, the red road down, which will go down to uh, Puerto Castaño. It'll head towards Trujillo, which I do not see on the map here. And then down to Cáceres. Um, and then what you can see on the map is the different types of things that are available here. These are the actual earnings of, or the property holdings of the church. So they own uh, lands, houses, aerial plots, irrigated plains, uh, special fishing weirs. These are where you can collect fish and catch fish through traps, uh, water mills, vineyards, and lands and pastures. These are all the holdings that are recorded in the Actus Capitulares that we'll be transcribing. So... As you can imagine, if these churchmen are controlling these resources, they can generate income themselves and make sure that they can pay themselves proper salaries, but also they can take those lands and actually maybe um, rent them themselves and produce things uh, for their own benefit. So what are those resources? And I, I cannot get away from pastoral life in Placencia. Um, and here you can see some sheep that are grazing under some olive trees, I believe. And uh, this is very close to Placencia. You'd be surprised. And so I'm just gonna take you a quick close look up. He was very suspicious of me, this this one sheep. He, he did not like me watching him. Um, and I keep one of these bells in my house that they're wearing just to remind me of Placencia and where I'm at. Oh, and then here is this <laughs> cute little sheep here who's shaking his tail. He's probably nursing from his mother, um, but it's just, you know, it is it is what life is like here. And then um, either you just would kind of wonder, well, like, gosh, these are the resources that were worked then and they're still at work today. Well, and, and where is this? I mean, you know, is this like, gosh, is this really far away from Placencia? Is it close by? Um, and in fact, I'm gonna pan over and you're gonna see the modern and medieval city of Placencia. And there's the cathedral on the far left. So I'm just on the other side of the river, Herte. Um, so these are the resources. They're right there, right within view. This is what allowed the cathedral and this community to, to do well for itself. Because you could, you know, there's wool, there's meat, there's milk, there's cheese. There's all kinds of uh, vegetables that can be produced. And these are all the substances that allow for cathedrals and individuals to make an economic living. And that's, I think, ultimately what this environment is about, is how these families kind of come together, Cajabajales and Santa Maria's, to collaborate, to use the cathedral for its own purposes, for their purposes of, of building a stronger family and a more wealth, um, and then also just using the natural resources. And those natural resources is an unusual way to think about it, but those natural resources are people too, humans. So Jews, Catholics, and Muslims, and converts all living there, they are human resources that can be activated for the community and realized to their full potential. And that's what we're gonna see in just a second as we start to look at this closer investigation of Placencia and the city. So let's talk about um, the resilience of Covivencia and Placencia, and let's look at this through uh, residential patterns. So what you're looking at right now, and let me just warrant you a little bit, is a is the south section of the city, and we're going to point out a couple things right away. First thing is if we look at the at the outside of the map, we'll see puertas. So Puerta de Berrosanas, Puerta de Coria, Puerta de Trujillo and at the bottom part of the Talavera. These are the main city gates leading out of the city in the direction of these different communities. So the part of the Coria is, would lead on the gate out going to the city of Coria close by. So that is the first feature. The second thing you'll notice is that those gates are um, integrated into a city wall. So this was a fully encapsulated city prote protected by a medieval wall. Next, we can take a look at some uh, ecclesiastical structures and main, main spaces. So if you look immediately to your right in the center of the screen, but to the right, you'll see the Plaza Mayor. So this is this 
should be the civic center of society in medieval Placencia. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see the cathedral. And that cathedral is what I would consider really in the ecclesiastical district. And then above that, you'll see, if you look very closely, um, a red dash line circling a region of the city. And so you'll see Calle de Terrillo at the bottom. You'll see that red line proceeds all the way to the Plaza Mayor. Then it goes up towards the Church of San Martin, which is circled in light blue, and then heads approximately towards the Puerto de Barrosanas, and then circles that far outer wall to the top, comes around Puerto de Coria, and drops all the way back to Puerto de Trujillo. So that zone is actually the borders of the Jewish Alhama or the Jewish the Huraria, the Jewish Quarter. And what we want to understand is, is what exactly is going on in the 1400s in Spain in this city in terms of coexistence of communities. And what you're going to see right away is something kind of quite unexpected. And we're going to take a very close look at this. The first thing you can look at is anything that you see in pinkish red those would be either Jewish institutions or Jewish individuals. So as you can imagine, we do have Jewish individuals living inside the Alhama as well as outside the Alhama on the Plaza Mayor. The other thing that's quite interesting is that we see Christian individuals. So you see these light blue squares that are inside the Juraria. These are Christian individuals living inside the Juraria. And then green uh, symbols, these are Christians, these are Carvajalas living inside the Juraria. And then you'll notice some other names, Estuniga, the big yellow square. You'll see an orange square named Almarez. You'll see another one labeled Alvarez, which is a tannish color. And what you start to see is this Jewish Alhama, which does not have any any walls encapsulating it. These are regular city streets. There are no walls separating it from the rest of the community. Is completely interpeppered with Christians, Jews, and conversos all living among it. And then similarly, when we look at the Plaza Mayor, as we start to look outside of the Juraria, we see mixed populations in the Plaza Mayor. And I'm going to point back to uh, right on the Plaza Mayor, you'll see a, a green box labeled G. GC. This is the night Diego Gonzalez de Carvajal and his family house. And we're going to talk a little bit about who's residing next to him and who he chooses to lease his houses to. So the areas that we're going to take a closer look at in terms of leasing uh, patterns, and this is specifically cathedral leases to Jewish and Muslim families during the 1401 to 1446 period, is uh, these areas. So you'll see in the Jewish Alhama, I've circled all these Jewish and Muslim individuals who have leased homes from the church um, for their residences and, and sometimes businesses. And what we know that's happening is that there's a great transformation. Remember those, those ordinances of Valladolid? And remember back to Avila and about that bishop who decided, you know, we are going to stop leasing properties to, to Jews? Well, in Placencia, something else really happens differently. And specifically, it happens to be something related to that Santa Maria Cover Hall Confederation. So we're about to look at some really intensive data in a second. So just as things should be getting worse for Jews and Jewish converts to Christianity in Spain, in Placencia, something else is happening entirely different. And there's a changing treatment of Jewish and Muslim families. Namely, and this is where I'm going to try to encapsulate this discussion, is that previous to this integration of the Santa Marias and the Copper Halls working together inside the church and creating this confederation, previous to that, the cathedral run by other families had actually um, limited leases to Jews and Muslims. And they, you know, in other words, these prior bishops and their leader and that leadership of the church basically only lease properties to Christians. And so we can see for this period, if you look in the first line of this table, from 1401 to 1423, if you look at the Actas Capitulares, we see these prior bishops. So there are a total of 27 houses that were up for lease, um, uh, um, uh, up for lease that went straight to Christians. 
That was 90%, 96% of all houses the church was leasing at that time went to Christians. And that same period, the bishops of that period, these that were not the Carvalho and Santa Maria's, only leased 4%, just one house, to Jews and Muslims. So this is very interesting. This is a very interesting dynamic because it says, as a policy, which we, we can acknowledge is, uh, there was no interest in leasing to these other communities. However, when we look in the 1424 to 1446 period, um, we can look and see what kind of uh, housing leases are occurring. Well, something's starting to change. Actually, there are 25 houses for a lease during this time period that go only to Christians, so about 78%. So it actually drops from 96% leases to 78%. And then on the other side, we see there are seven new houses just in this 20-year period that are now going to be leased to Jews and Muslims. So there's a 22% increase. So this is really interesting because what it shows is it seems to indicate a change in dynamic, which is it's not extensive, but clearly something has changed that the Santa Medias and Carvajalas are opening up leases to new families that are Jewish and Muslim background. Now, I do think this might have something to do with prices too. So if we look in 1401 to 1423, we see that the average lease rate for a Christian, uh, for a house is 55 maravedis. I will also highlight this usually includes the payment of two pairs of chickens. Don't ask me why, <laughs> uh, but that's a typical lease. But then we see um, under the previous, prior bishops, the lease, average lease is about 55 maravedis. Then under the Carvajals and Santa Maria's, it increases to 109 maravedis. So they're increasing. Obviously, there's some uh, debasing of coinage probably in this time period. But overall, there's an increase in, in the expense of houses. Um, so they double the lease rates for, for Christians. But then on the other side, if you look at Jews and Muslims, they were already paying. That's just that one house. So it's limited data. But we have this one house that was leased for 150 maravedis under the prior bishops, and then under the Santa Maria's and Cover Halls, the average lease then is 191 Maravedis. So there's an increase in rents there too, not as a steep in uh, increase in cost for, for um, as uh, the, the cost increase for Jews and Muslims is a percentage is not as high as it was for Christians, but it's still, you know, in relative terms, more, these are more expensive leases. So what you can see is, well, maybe the Santa Maria's and Governor Halls, not only do we want to lease more property to Jews and Muslims, but if we do that, we can also make more money. And this is because we can see this commercial activity of this community of Jews and Muslims are, are very important in terms of wool production and agricultural production um, and wine production. It's, qu it's quite uh, extensive and, and also tax farming. So let's take a closer look now at a couple of different places. So um, to kind of capture this sense of um, integration of communities, we can look first at this area, which is the Plaza San Nicolas, and this is an important zone. Next, we'll take a closer look at this kind of uh, small section of the Juerería, which is very intermixed as well, and who's living there. And finally, we'll take a closer look at the Plaza Mayor, at the far tip of the Huraria, but we can start to look at who's living there and what they're doing. So in the Plaza San Nicolas, let me point out a couple of structures here. First, what we can see at the bottom is the, the Church of San Nicolas, which has the crucifix on it. Uh, immediately to its left are the church chapter houses for the University of Placencia, which is described in the records. Behind that is a house that says leased to a Jewish family, Jew. So this is a family that was actually leased to Zafinas Kap, uh, Zappa or Kappa, who is a maker of chain mill. It's very interesting because this housing lease to Mr. Uh, Kappa uh, indicates clearly that the Christians were getting uh, arm, armor and arms from Jewish makers. And I think that says something about the level of um, 
of trust. You don't ask someone to make armor for you if you don't trust them. I also mentioned that the name Zafinus is not the actual correct first name of this individual. This is from the traslado or the transcription of the original document, and he has a different name. So I'm going to wait and see when folks start to look through our documents if they find his original name. But I'm going to refer to him as Zafinus. So the, uh, the Kappas lived on Calle de Rua, and we know that they lived adjacent to the Church of San Nicolas, as well as right next to this church of uh, the Church Cathedral um, University. And uh, in terms of the Church of St. Nicholas, it was particularly important because it is said that in extraordinary circumstances, a Jewish judge and a Christian judge stood on the church steps and educated. Uh, uh, adjudicated cases or heard judicial cases that involved in individuals of different faiths. So that's kind of important. We also see this uh, building that's labeled uh, red, which is uh, C-O-F-R, which was a cofradia of, of Jew Jews. And we all we know is that it was described as a Jewish brotherhood and some type of association, some type of fraternal organization. And then we can also see the synagogue where it lo was located and where there was this um, large block of homes known as La Mota. And then also where the Estuniga family, these conversos that were extremely elite, would build their palace. So let's take a look at it today. And this will kind of point out where things were. So here you can see the Estuniga's palace built during the 1400s. And immediately to the left is where the synagogue would be. But the synagogue was taken down and the convent in the name of St. Vincent de Ferrer was placed there by the Estonigas. So let's take a look at that. So you can see here, here's the Estonigas palace again. Um, you can see the outlines of the convent there, and that's where the synagogue would have been, and the cofradia was in the far left of that image. Then across the street, what we'd had was the Church of San Nicolas. And you can see the second arrow pointing to the right. That's roughly where we think this university was located. I think we should think of this as not necessarily like a full-fledged university, but where there is some kind of religious education occurring for young men as they proceed. And, and most of these individuals will then would go on to the University of Salamanca for their religious training. And let's take one last look here. So what you can see at that point then is, is that that was that little section there, but we're right in the middle of that Huraria, and yet our Jewish Alhama, and we see there's the Church of St. Nicholas, there uh, is a Jewish individual making armor for Christians, the Estunigas will place their palace there, and then there's the synagogue. So this is not a separated zone for only for Jewish individuals and families. It is quite intermixed. So what about in the midsection of the Huraria? Here we find more Christians. So here is the Avares de Toledo family and their castle, or I should say it's more their, their family homes, um, and there's a tower there. This Avares de Toledo family, which were the Señores de Oropresa, would eventually intermarry with the Carvajales. Um, and this is you know right there inside of the Juraria. You can see that, that it's within the boundaries. And then also we can appreciate this image as well. So looking down this alleyway, so looking from the Avarez house and looking down the alleyway, we can look all the way into the street. And there we can see that there would be, at the far end, we're gonna run into a bunch of different houses. But on the right-hand side is this house, which is the church, this is the, uh, what would be later known as the Palacio de Carvajal y Giron. This is where Rodrigo de Carvajal, who was an archdeacon in the 1400s, where he lived, and obviously the structure was built up later, but he lived as well inside the um, inside the Jurería. And then, as you'll notice, I'm going to go ahead and point this out, um, you will see close to the RC, across the street where you see these SMs, those are the Santa Maria family. So they are living right across the street from here. And then in the case where they're blue houses, these are actually family houses that they owned. And then the ones that are like two-toned, blue and white, those are those are Santa Maria occupied homes, uh, but that were owned by the church. 
And you can kind of also make out in between where it says SM and then Jew and then SM and SM. There's like a white line that kind of enters behind the houses. That is actually um, an enclosed now an enclosed uh, passageway or alleyway. And guess what? This goes back to that Gonzalo Gutierrez de, de la Calleja. So it was the Gonzalo Gutierrez family, but I believe they pick up the their name because the Santa Maria's that particular family lived on this calle up right here. So that says something about how names evolved. The last thing that we can point out, and I, I never quite know what to do with this, but it, it I think it, it's, it's revealing in its own way. Also deep inside the Jurería, we can find this La Casa de Jamón, which is a, you know, a Spanish ham store, uh, or, you know, Jamón Serrano store and Iberico hams and all kinds of ex, uh, products from the uh, Exmaradura. But this particular corner house used to be where one of the, when, where one of the Santa Maria Converso families lived. And now there's, there's ham there. So uh, I'll leave it to you to, to think about that. <laughs> Lastly, I, I would like just to kind of highlight what is happening on the Plaza Mayor. And so we can see again, there's two churches that are very close, close proximity to the Plaza Mayor. There's San Martin to the above and then below San Esteban. And then you see DGC there. So what's interesting here is that DGC is that night that I mentioned early on, the night Diego Gonzalez de Carvajal, who would later within two generations start producing churchmen and then bureaucrats and then finally cardinals. Well, DGC lived right there on the Plaza Mayor. And, you know, for someone who was involved in the Reconquista and as a knight, you know, sworn to protect Christianity and to reconquer the Iberian Peninsula, um, it's interesting to note that he lives on the Plaza Mayor, probably in the most uh, public zone next to uh, a Jewish individual who was renting a house from the cathedral. So you can see that circled there. And then a Muslim individual releasing another home from the cathedral. So the night, uh, Diego Gonzalez Carver Hall, his two immediate neighbors, Jewish and Muslim. Even more interesting is right behind him, you'll see uh, three uh, boxes. One, there are pink, pinkish red, and then green. So we also know that DGC owned three homes behind his. And he chose not to lease those to his own family members or to lease them to Christians. He actually chose to lease those to Jewish individuals. So, you know, I, it, these are the facts on the ground. The facts on the ground tell us something really different. In this city of Placencia in the 1400s, not only is the Juderia not completely encapsulated by its own walls. It is heavily peppered with Christians living all through it, as well as conversos, conversos that are churchmen. In addition, we find knights living in the Juraria. Then, when we get closer to the Plaza Mayor, the main institutional center of the city, um, where you know civic life should center, at least in its secular sense, we find Jewish and Muslim individuals living all around the Plaza Mayor, integrated, and we find... Christian knights leasing property to Jewish families. So it's um, it's a different, this seems to be a form of covivincy in action here that it's very positive in the 1400s and um, complicates the history, if nothing else. And we can see here, I'm just going to take another look at that Plasma Mayor, and you'll recognize it from the beginning of this presentation when I showed those images. Um, on the far side of the Plasma Mayor, you'll see another Muslim and another Jewish family who are residing in homes and, and that same vicinity. Um, technically, this is the edge of the Huda, of the um, Muslim Alhama or the Muslim quarter. So it's interesting to find a Jewish family over there as well. So what are some conclusions we can make about Placencia and Spanish Covencia? Well, unlike other Hurarias, this one was this one still prospered a bit under changing conditions. Um, old Christians and new Christians in the Huria are definitely living there together. Uh, Jewish and Muslims were also living outside their respective religious quarters. There seemed to have been some political and economic interconnections of Jews and Christians, especially in this area of leasing properties that, you know, this is a good, good relationship for us. Um, there seems to have been also a special bond between the old Christian Carver Hall family 
and the Santa Marias generating a type of confederation. But nonetheless, what we know, I think, at the end is, is that it's an uncertain future for Jews and conversos after the 1440s as we march towards the expulsion of the Jews and even more uh, blood purity laws. So that's what I have to say about Placentia and its history of Jews, Catholics, and converts. Thanks for listening.